Hello, and welcome to Emmanuel Church Rio Rico's online virtual worship for April 7th, 2024. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you today grateful for your enormous love, for your amazing, wonderful mercy, for the grace that you shower on us so undeservedly, for looking for us when we wander from you. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this. And Lord, we lift up to you those who are suffering, those who have suffered loss of life and families that are dealing with that loss, those who are sick in the hospital or at home and recovering from illness, those who have been injured, those who are suffering from the effects of severe weather, those who are recovering from terrible earthquakes, Lord, those who are in the in the path of harm because of wars raging around them. Lord, we ask for peace. We ask for hope. We ask for healing. But mostly we ask for your presence. In your precious name we pray. Amen. We're continuing our look at the book of Luke after a couple of weeks off looking at uh, Palm Sunday and Easter. And we're looking more at chapter 15, and this is the third in a series of parables that Jesus told about things that had been lost and then were found. So I'm calling this lost boy because, well, that's what it's about, a boy who loses himself and yet finds himself before it's all over with. So let's look. First, carry on my wayward son. Starting in verse 11, Jesus continued as he's already told two parables about a lost coin, a lost sheep. There was a man who had two sons. Now, understand, first of all, this is not a real person. This is a parable. Jesus presents it as a parable. It is a fictional story that tells a deeper truth. And so we have to remember that we can't look for too many details here uh, because it's, it's a story meant to illustrate a point. So this man has two sons not unusual in those days. And and under normal circumstances, the oldest son would receive either all or most of the property. As the firstborn son, he would get most everything. The younger son would either get a lesser amount or, or in some cases, nothing. But we'll see that this father is, is a generous and, and a, a loving father. So he has two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now, this might not sound unreasonable. It might sound like, oh, he's just asking for what to do him. But, but what he's really doing <clears throat> is saying, Father, I don't want to wait till you're dead. I want what's coming to me now. In other words, the property is more important to him than his relationship with his father. We see this a lot, where things become far more valuable to people than people are. But the father is caring. So he divided his property between them. Now, while this might happen uh, in some cases where the property would be kind of divvied up before the father was dead, but the father would still own it all until he died. But in this case, he actually gives it to the younger son. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, we can assume that this boy is Jewish because Jesus is speaking to a Jewish audience, and they would have, of course, assumed that he was Jewish. And so, of course, he went off to a distant country because, you know, far away, that's where all the bad things happen. That's where people do things that we don't like. So it was just a, 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 a easy way to say, oh yeah, you know how those distant places are. They do all kinds of terrible, wild things. And so he goes there and spends it all in wild living, not given specifics, but whatever he did, it cost him a bundle of money. So after he spent everything, and now, Think about how hard that can be. There was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. Now, famines were certainly not unheard of in the ancient world or the modern world. Weather changes, uh, droughts, 
fires, floods, all kinds of things can cause famines. And when there is no food to be had, even wealthy people might have trouble getting food. If you have spent everything that you own, then you don't have any way of buying it. I have seen this over my years of ministry where people have come looking for help and inevitably when they're the most desperate, when they have nowhere to turn, it is frequently because they have no family. Now, in this case, this young man had abandoned his family. He left them behind while he went to this distant country. But it often happens in our own country that either people have no family, their parents are dead, they have no brothers or sisters, no aunts or uncles, no grandparents. So there is no one to be of help to them. And this is not unheard of by any means. And that's when they get the most desperate. Or they have so alienated their family through arguments, sometimes physical fights, through drug abuse, from through stealing, all sorts of things where they have no one to help them. And this is where this young man finds himself. He's far away from his family. Of course, communication, I mean, it could take weeks, maybe months for a letter to get somewhere. And the way you got a letter delivered was you gave it to somebody that was going the same direction you wanted the letter to go and hoped that they would deliver it. So communication was really kind of out and he needs something. He's desperate. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. Could there be a more humiliating job for a Jewish boy than to feed an unclean animal like a pig? I don't think so. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now, it's not that he couldn't take those pods and eat them. It's that those pods were not edible by humans. What a pig can eat is far different than what a human can and will eat. And so just feeding the pigs, he was hungry for what they were eating, but he, he couldn't, and nobody was giving him any food. So he's quite desperate. Next, peace when you are done. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. Now, there's a point Jesus makes here that he doesn't really dwell on, but I think it's an important one. Sometimes it takes hitting rock bottom before we come to our senses and realize what fools we have been. It is often not until after we have made the worst mistakes possible, when we have come close to ruining our lives, that we finally realize that there was an always a better way and that we were dumb to do the things we did. That's what this young man did. It is especially common in young people because young people do not have the experience to weigh what they want against what they need and against what their resources are. In this case, he realizes that even his father's servants are treated better than he is. As he's there feeding these, these unclean animals, working as a swine herd in a foreign country, his, his father's servants all have plenty of food, more than enough to eat. So he realizes this and he says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. So he knows that what he did is, is quite frankly inexcusable. Uh, it, it, there is no good reason to behave the way he behaved. And so what he does is decide that he'll go back, ask his father not to take him back as his son, but just to hire him as a, as a worker in his fields. He, he doesn't, he knows he's not worthy. He knows he's done wrong. He knows that not only has he sinned against his father, he's, he's sinned against God in the way he treated his father. And so often this is the case. But he had 
hopes because he knew his father was a compassionate man. So he heads back to his father. But while he's still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. Get this. The father has been looking for him to come back. He's been longing for his son to return. This is just like our heavenly father. When we turn our backs on God, when we wander, when we fill our lives with sin and selfishness instead of trusting and loving him, even then he loves us. It's like Paul says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died. It wasn't when we cleaned our act up, it was while we were at our worst that Christ did the best for us. And so the father's watching for him. He sees him, he loves him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him, not the reception the son expected. He expects to be chided, to be scolded, to be, to be treated the way he deserved to be treated, even punished. And yet the father treats him exactly the opposite, with love, compassion, and great mercy. The son said to him, because he had this speech ready, you know he's not even paying attention, but, but he says it because he's been practicing it. And you know he said it over and over every step of this journey, even as he didn't have food or maybe sometimes didn't have enough water, as he was sometimes threatened by the elements. He was practicing this speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The robe, the best robe, was undoubtedly the father's robe that he's giving to the son. The ring was the father's ring that he's giving him. The sandals for his feet. And think about it. This boy must have been walking barefoot or on with just rags on his feet, coming back to his father. And the father won't have that. He's going to have him taken care of. He says, bring the fattened calf and kill it. The best meal. This is, this is, he's saying, serve veal for my son. We're having a feast because he is alive again. He is found after he's been lost. And it is time to celebrate. This is what Jesus was talking about earlier when he says the angels in heaven are, are celebrating when lo one lost soul is found and returned. And that's the way we see this happening, a tremendous earthly celebration, which is nothing compared to the celebration in heaven when a lost soul is found. Finally, don't you cry no more. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. Remember the older son? We don't hear much about him until now. He's in the field working. Whose field is that? Oh, it's going to be his field. He's working for himself. So when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he doesn't know what all this is about. That's not a festival day. It's not a marriage. Why, why would there be so much music and dancing and, and feasting? So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother's come, he replied, and your father's killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. So he tells him exactly what's happening. Now, is the older brother taking after the father here saying, oh, thank God my younger brother is back. Praise you, Lord, for bringing him home safe and sound. I can't wait to get back to the celebration and, and, and rejoice that my brother is found. That's what you'd think. Look what he does. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, come home, you killed a fattened calf for him. Now, the calf was fattened for some kind of feast. Maybe the young older brother's wedding coming up. Who knows? And he says, I've been slaving for you all these years. But 
is he really? Or was he really working for himself? Because he knows everything left will be his. So he's being a bit disingenuous here, isn't he? I've been slaving for you. No, he's been slaving for himself. Now, he did behave, he says, and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat, not even some cabrito, so my friends and I could have a party. How often do we expect great rewards for simply doing what we should be doing? And how often are we disappointed that God has not rewarded us in some tangible, physical way simply for doing what we should be doing? Yes, that's exactly what's happened here. He is furious because this younger brother, who seemed to get it all, is now being rewarded for his bad behavior. He, he doesn't even know what happened. He just know he left and he came back destitute. But the older brother accuses him of wasting his money with prostitutes. Maybe, but maybe not. Who knows? But look how the father answers. He doesn't scold him. He doesn't chide him. Because the older brother has been working faithfully for him. He says, my son, the father said, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. And he's talking not only in a, in a general, gracious sense, he's really speaking kind of legally here. All that's left here is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You see, that is what the celebration in heaven is about the return of those who were lost, the, the revivification, the bringing back to life of those who had been spiritually dead. We don't know what the older brother does, but it is my hope that he repents and heads back to the celebration with the Father. Because the one thing God wants is for his children to be with him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us to seek out those who are lost. Help us to welcome those who return. And help us to be as loving and gracious and forgiving as the Father. Help us to be your loving children. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you and go in peace.